Não. No fim. Joanna, I've started the recording, so feel free to begin whenever you're ready. Uh, hello, Christina. Sorry, I'm struggling a bit with the slides that are. Um, I'm trying to share my screen, but what they what is happening? They are moving um, uh, as though there was a a mode that I, it's not an animation. So I'm wondering what is happening here. I'm going to try to do it again. Have you tried the bottom? At the bottom, there's a couple of options there that might work for you. So when you open the PowerPoint presentation, there should be a full screen option at the bottom. I don't yeah. believe that helps with the automation. I think I'll stop I don't it. Know what happened? Stop sharing. Okay. In worst case scenario, I'm not going to go into full slide mode if this keeps on happening. So I'm going to try again. And I'm going to wait for a tiny bit. It, it keeps on just running. I think it's I for everybody, see. not just for me. I don't know what happens. So what we might have to do is basically to just run this presentation and not a, a full screen mode. Uh, I'm really sorry about that, but I don't know why it's happening at all. So hello, That's everyone. <laughs> hello, everyone. I'm, I'm Joanna Wild. I'm um, a senior uh, digital, digital learning designer at INASP. And I will be co-presenting today with uh, my two colleagues, uh, Veronica Scheffler and Ravi uh, Murugasen. Veronica is a digital learning designer at our organization and Ravi is technical uh, developer. What is the plan for today? Um, I will give you a bit of a background to what INASP is, what we do and uh, the study we have conducted recently. Uh, we will ask you then to vote on the parts of the presentation you would like to uh, us to prioritize. Uh, we will present the findings from the study, but we will break up our presentation with your reactions and discussions. And then we will wrap up with main conclusions from the study um, at the very end. So about INASP, very briefly, um, INASP has been around for a long time, coming up to 30 years. And our vision is research and knowledge at the heart of development. And our mission is to support individuals and institutions to produce, share, and use research and knowledge to, to transform lives. Um, we have been working online um, for many years, initially setting up online systems for self-and journals, training journal editors on how to improve the quality of their journals, training researchers on how to publish and, and librarians on uh, the aspects of copyright and licensing. And initially, uh, quite a lot of this training was face to face, but then we saw that the demand for training was huge and we could reach by far more people if we delivered more or the, or of this training online. So gradually, uh, our online learning offer has increased and it includes MOOCs, specialist courses for smaller audiences, self-study tutorials, e-mentoring opportunities, and online journal clubs. Uh, however, we recognize that online learning is complementary to more traditional approaches to capacity development. So we do not uh, simply seek to replace uh, approaches such as workshops with online modes of delivery. In instead, we use digital technology to enhance what we do. Um, it gives us, for example, an extra space uh, where learning can happen in between and after the face-to-face -face interventions. It ensures continuity of learning for a series of engagements rather than just one of initiatives. Uh, it helps us embed learning into the real context of work and at the point of need. It also provides an opportunity to do things differently, to use both digital and um, physical spaces to their greatest advantage uh, and, and, and the best combination. So at INASP, uh, online learning is part of a, of a bigger learning journey and a wider capacity approaches. 
Um, we have been systematically uh, collecting data on our learning interventions and used feedback to improve what we do. Last year, we decided to conduct a synthesis of uh, data on our TEL initiatives uh, collected over the past decade from uh, roughly 2011 to 2020. Uh, and we commissioned an external uh, research consultant to do this analysis for us. So the types of data included in the analysis uh, were learning analytics and par participant feedback data. We analyzed data for more than 20 different online and blended learning activities or courses, many of which we run on multiple occasions. Data were combined across courses um, to ensure robustness. Uh, we included also qualitative data from semi-structured interviews with INAS partners. Uh, we interviewed around 20 uh, INAS partners about their experience of te uh, technology enhanced learning and the impact of specific initiatives um, in the period between 2015 and 2020. Um, we also included secondary literature uh, that was produced at INASP uh, throughout the years into this synthesis. Uh, this included 30 published reports and blogs, in addition to a range of internal reports and documentation. And finally, we also reviewed academic literature, uh, which considers um, technology-enhanced learning either exclusively or partially within the context of uh, the Global South. We included um, a total of 30 books and articles in our synthesis, and these formed a backdrop against which uh, to interpret our data. So what then is the broader picture regarding TEL in the Global South? Uh, there has been a dramatic expansion in TEL since 2010, which is reflected in number of publication. This has been further accelerated by COVID pandemic recently. Uh, a large body of the literature is concerned, uh, concentrated on MOOCs. Uh, there is much less uh, written up about other approaches to online and blended learning. Um, discussion in the literature focuses on a number of key dimensions and presents online learning as a negative alternative to blended and face-to-face -face learning. Uh, and issues that are being pointed out include a lack of accessibility for women, for people living in rural areas, and those with lower, lower level of educational attainment, poor completion, completion rates overall, pressures of time, whether learning is asynchronous or synchronous, and a lack of interaction uh, with peers and trainers. Uh, we were able to identify six assumptions uh, prevalent in the academic literature around TEL in the Global South. Uh, we then tested these assumptions against INASP evidence. And today we wanted to present to you the results of this um, exercise. Uh, for each of the assumptions, what we will do is to present our findings and whether they support or challenge existing literature. We will explain uh, what we think contributed to these results, and then we will illustrate our approach uh, with one case study. Um, before doing that, we would like you to uh, tell us which of the common assumptions would you like us to prioritize in today's presentation? Uh, there are six of them, and we have a Menti code, um, and we would like you to, to go to menti.com, put the code in, and rank from one to six, uh, where one is your first choice, and six is your last choice in terms of uh, the assumptions you would like us to present. What it help, will help us with, it will help us to structure the presentation in a way that we can present the result, then have a discussion with you about the results for each and every assumption. Uh, and then if we lack the time to present one or two, uh, the slides, we will make them available uh, anyway via old, and uh, we will be able to, to read upon the ones that we haven't managed to present today. So let's see how it goes. I'll uh, hand over to Veronica now. I'll stop sharing my screen and um, Veronica will share the code, although you can see the code as well. 
and we can go on into the voting. Veronica, are you going to share the screen with the voting code as well, or shall I come back to the slide? I hope it's coming up now. Can you hear me? Yeah, you can, you can see that. I can see that. Okay, and you can hear me as well? Yeah, very well. Good, good, good. Then I, I think we, we will give you a couple of minutes so that you really can make your choice. And then uh, I will share the results so that everybody can see what was prioritized today. If there are any questions uh, or you have any difficulties with Mentimeter, then just let us know. But I can see that there are voices coming in now. I assume that most of people who have wanted to vote have voted now because many coming in are anymore. So I, I, I'm, I'm sharing now the results, but if you're still busy with uh, voting, then you will see it will still be counted. So currently, uh, the first choice is interaction online is limited. Second choice is technology is a barrier. Third choice is one size fits all is problematic. Fourth choice is lower level of equity in participation. Fifth, blending face to face and online is better. And sixth, timetabling online learning is challenging. I don't think that there are further votes coming in. Jenna, have you noted down the... Yes, I've tried to note them down and um, <laughs> uh, we can now stop, I think, sharing. I hope I, I got it all. A uh, timetabling is the last one. Okay. Um, and uh, we can start with the first one, which is interaction online is, is limited. And I'll just uh, start sharing again yeah. the slides. And I'm stop sharing now. And I'll you should sharing. be able to take over again. Coming back to the slides. Um, let me know if you can see them. Veronica, are they visible again, the slides? Yes, yes, we can see. Okay, great. 
what I'm gonna try and do is to start the presentation mode again because it worked for me on my computer uh, I don't know why when I start doing it here on blackboard it's just not working so I'm gonna try and see if it works this time and it does it stopped running by itself that's great um, so um, assumption uh, four that we um, uncovered in the literature is that tell does not support participant interactions well which has a negative impact on uh, learning outcomes. So our varying approaches to encourage interaction between participants and their facilitators and peers are viewed extremely positively. Uh, the vast majority of our participants feel that level of moderation and facilitation was enough to complete the course successfully. Uh, more than three in 10 um, identified facilitator support on the forums as actually a success factor and a similar proportion cited interaction with other participants on the forums as a success factor contributing to their completion. Um, so in these terms, the, the, um, why the literature is at odds with our findings, uh, we also have found that most participants uh, found feedback they received from peers useful and many appreciated uh, ben the benefit of giving feedback themselves. Um, it's similar on our specialist courses. For example, 95% of participants in the course on improving journal quality for journal editors rated the feedback they received from the facilitator as useful. Uh, in another small course on transformative learning um, and teaching 14 out of 16 participants identified uh, facilitator support as one of the success of the course, while 10 singled out that uh, Zoom drop-in clinics were particularly useful to them. Uh, even when our online activities involved no interaction, like in our self-study tutorials, only a small minority identified this as a problem. So just uh, between 12 and 16% of participants in our self-study tutorials said that um, a lack of moderator or uh, facilitator support was a problem. However, when a tutorial was offered then uh, in a light touch facilitation mode, uh, dropouts reduced by half, and I'm gonna talk about it a bit more later. So what do we think has contributed to the key findings? Um, for um, Strong focus on creating a community of learner, learners in each course is definitely a factor. Uh, that we find is contributing to these findings. So definitely uh, we try to understand when international collaboration will be of value to people and when to create smaller, um, more intimate groups of learners. Uh, another point is um, the guest facilitation model. Uh, we draw in our MOOCs from uh, a global community uh, to recruit uh, to recruit uh, guest facilitators that's on the course. And this model has been hugely successful in ensuring good interaction rates in the discussion forums. As you know, MOOCs are um, uh, in thousands and uh, it's very often difficult to uh, have good uh, facilitated in discussions on the forum, whereas with guest facilitation model, uh, we get a huge number of facilitators helping out to run successful discussion in our forums. Um, uh, as it, when it comes to uh, group work and um, authentic assessment, we try to embed it in every single course. Uh, and so we have quite a lot of uh, peer review activities um, and peer support activities, which we also think contribute to success. Uh, our courses are mostly asyn asynchronous for flexibility and inclusion, but we organize live sessions to create a feeling of presence among the learners and facilitators. Uh, we have um, live drop-in clinics uh, to discuss particular issues or to troubleshoot problems, for example, using Zoom, as this is a platform widely used in the developing countries, but we also use live text-based sessions um, uh, via WhatsApp. We mostly use tools uh, that people are comfortable with on our courses or are already familiar with. So for example, Zoom is widespread in developing countries we work with, but Microsoft Teams uh, is not and very often create problems. We try not to add more than one new or less familiar tool per course. We are keen to introduce people to doing things differently with technology, but we do not want to prioritize technology over learning. Um, finally, in our self-study tutorials, we build in um, 
what we call the facilitator voice into the content by developing reflective exercises and activities and then providing examples of solutions and commentaries. So to create this feeling of presence that there is somebody actually uh, providing some commentaries and feedback on the activities that people are completing. Um, in 2021, we launched our critical thinking course, both as a self-study tutorial and in light uh, facilitated version. Mm -hmm. uh, facilitation involved supporting participants through announcements about the expected learning progress once or twice per week, uh, answering technical questions on a technical forum, and encouraging participants to share their ideas and questions in the content related uh, discussion forum. So facilitation was mainly restricted to keeping an eye on the post to make sure that discussions were respectful and relevant. Uh, it was a light touch facilitation, as I mentioned. So then we compared feedback data from the two courses and participants in the facilitated version of the course reported slightly more positive outcomes that those who completed the self-study version. However, what is more interesting is that those who began the facilitated course were almost twice as likely to complete it compared with those who undertook the self-study tu tutorial. So there is some evidence that the presence of interaction may uh, secure higher compression rates, perhaps by motivating participants to um, or sustaining the interest. So that's, that's our findings around interaction. As, as you can see, the um, findings that we've got are at this um, at a bit in, at odds with what we found in the wider literature from 2010 uh, to the recent literature uh, in the Global South. And we would love to now open up a conversation around, around this, uh, maybe around the question like, which of our findings resonate with your own experience? Uh, what approaches have worked for you in terms of uh, facilitating interaction? Um, and what challenges have you experienced if you worked uh, in this area uh, with, uh, with the global self? I'm going to stop sharing for now and uh, see if we have people who would like to join the conversation with us. I'm not sure if we have anything already in the chat panel. Not really. Is there anyone who would like to share their experiences or tell us if the finding resonates resonate with them? There is Will raising hand. Uh -huh, you can hear me okay. Yeah, very well, thank you. Hi, uh, yeah, I just, um, I thought it was interesting about the, the way you talk about uh, the, the interaction and the importance of that uh, with the facilitator. Uh, one of the things I felt is when you've planned interactions online, it is a tendency for the designer to, to be more limited uh, and anticipate more issues that you wouldn't have to do in face-to-face. -face. So learning activity, Face to face, uh, you can quickly correct misunderstandings, provide extra support, and assess continually by looking at faces. I think not being able to see body language faces, uh, it means you can't respond on the fly in a way you typically would face to face. And once you're aware of that, it colours your design of any kind of interactions online. Yeah, that's very true. Well, thank you for sharing that. It's it's uh, it totally resonates with with our experience. Yeah. Um, anyone else would like to share their experience in this area? Or shall we just move on to the next assumption, which is the barrier to technology? From what I'm reading, so I'm, if there is nobody else raising cards or coming, I'm I'm just gonna share the slides again. Um, and we're going to go into the second assumption. Um, and I hope you can see my slides again. And let's go to technological barriers. Uh, Ravi? Yeah. Hi. 
Right. Uh, thank you, Joanna. Uh, as I mentioned in the chat, there could be some uh, background noise. Uh, could be loud. I don't know how how my computer filters out uh, the noise because it's Diwali over here. Uh, so I'll uh, try to do my best to go uh, to narrate clearly. Um, so this is one of the assumptions um, we uh, we investigated: technological barriers to online participation. Uh, you know. Uh, are, are significant. So, um, so the key findings are that uh, a sizable minority of our participants do experience barriers to online learning, but um, their experience is, uh, or these barriers uh, which lead to non-completion or non-participation are more likely due to infrastructure issues um, rather than usability issues. In a sense, it's more about access to the internet and even electricity, and that's something we, we see every now and then in our feedback survey. Electricity issues also come in the way, not to mention the you know, internet access um, can be uh, intermittent um, or limited data. So here, um, and also percentage of a country's population, you know, uh, most of our learners are in Africa and uh, in, in some countries, um, you know, internet uh, access is quite limited. Um, another thing, uh, I think especially over the past year, over the pandemic, so time management has turned out to be uh, quite a challenge for a lot of our learners. Um, uh, has, uh, there's a lot of from home working online happening and with online courses, uh, it, it can be uh, you know, more difficult time management. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so so uh, we think the usability issues uh, are not pronounced. Uh, the infrastructure issues, we can't do anything about that. But in terms of their actual experience on learning with us, uh, uh, these are our thoughts on um, uh, on this, on the usability. We think Moodle LMS is a good choice. Um, for two reasons, there are many uh, content and activity tools that fit our low bandwidth approach. There is, um, we used uh, mostly text-based content or otherwise we provide text alternatives as well. And uh, Moodle is also quite popular in the global south. And some of our participants may have encountered it before. Our uh, course materials are compatible with mobile devices. Um, uh, for small screens. We provide downloadable resources um, and whenever we use videos or other multimedia, we, we provide text-based alternatives. Um, and uh, also, one factor is that our participants, most of them work, study or work in higher education settings where uh, there is typically you know, better access to internet and computers than perhaps the, for the average person in any given country. So that's something that is uh, that we've kind of benefited from the, the nature of our participants, their work environment is somewhat conducive for them for them to participate uh, in online courses. Uh, next slide, please. So a case study. Now this is not to do with Moodle or online courses, but something else uh, for online journal clubs. Um, uh, a journal club is a, is where a group of researchers get together to discuss journal papers. And the authoring project, we we are uh, we run research writing MOOCs, and there are other elements providing of researcher support. Um, so one of which is uh, journal clubs. We set up online journal clubs in 2017, uh, 2019, sorry. Uh, and we initially selected different platforms. We set up one on WhatsApp, or maybe two on WhatsApp, two on WhatsApp, one on Facebook, and one on an email list. And, it, and slowly we saw that WhatsApp was it was a place where uh, participants were more engaged in discussions and sharing their thoughts. And uh, we switched the other journal clubs to uh, WhatsApp as well. And here's a quote from uh, a program specialist at Inas, was also the author project manager. And um, we've seen, sometimes some of us, I mean, earlier when he used to travel uh, to our partner countries. Uh, so in, in Africa and Asia, and I live in India, and this is something is my own lived experience. So a lot of people use WhatsApp for uh, professional communication, not just personal, um, uh, you know, interaction. So 
uh, or maybe some of the other mobile uh, apps. So this uh, WhatsApp has, has uh, been useful or has proven successful for this kind of interaction. So yeah, that's uh, uh, next slide. Okay, so um, uh, do you have any thoughts on, uh, do you have similar experience or, uh, yeah, you can use the chat window or speak with us? Yeah, it would be great to hear um, about your experiences in this area, especially technological barriers. Um, and uh, I'm not sure if anybody would like to speak. Uh, we'll give you a little bit longer, and if there are no people who want to speak, then we will proceed to the next assumption. I can't see anything in chat either. Oh, we've got Sheldon. Hello, thank you. Thanks for that. Hi, really thank you. Um, I was really, I was just curious about kind of the, there was a kind of mention of kind of uh, designing for mobile devices and I was just curious to know kind of what your process is for ensuring kind of things are mobile friendly, just because I know that, you know, just to design for a smaller screen can take very specific um, kind of expertise. So, um... Thanks, Sheldon. Um, so it's a kind of a little spec, uh, spectrum of uh, mobile compatibility. We have our our MOOC, the sort of the flagship MOOC research writing, where it's very very compatible with the even the Moodle mobile app, and we've uh, and that's partly and uh, to be, and the way we started was actually even before we um, thought of the app. It was, it was some a number of years back, and we wanted to keep that course as low bandwidth as possible and. It was, it's pretty much, uh, it's really quite text-based, yet interactive. Um, we use uh, an external tool called EXE Learning, which is quite a low bandwidth authoring tool. And it turns out it works well, even with the app, and it's responsive. Uh, the HTML content that's produced is, is responsive for small screens. And many of the modal activities over time uh, have become more uh, uh, compatible with mobile learning. Uh, it's... Um, it's some, we're not invested uh, extra effort in, in the technology side. We're just trying to work with what uh, Moodle provides. And in some of our other courses where there is an emphasis on a kind of, uh, uh, and in our, in our kind of uh, pedagogical design, we imagine the learner sitting at a computer because there are, there's a lot of discussion. They're switching between a learning resource, clicking on the li link to a contextual forum, and coming back. And we, uh, so we advise the learners that, you know, this is co this course is, uh, you know, ideally, you know, you, uh, to be, you, you've got to sit at a computer to take the course, but parts of the course, uh, they can certainly, you know, engage with it online. So it's a kind of, it's a bit of a spectrum of how mobile compatibility. So I wouldn't say all of our courses are like 100% compatible with the Moodle mobile app. No, it's not really that. And some of our courses, we encourage, you know, computer-based study while allowing for the option of some mobile study. And we check the course materials uh, with on on a mobile on a, on an internet browser on a on a on a, on a phone uh, just to see if it, it it's showing up all right. So. Thank you, Ravi. Is there anyone else who would like to ask a question or who would like to share their experience on um, uh, dealing with barriers to technology, including uh, designing for mobile uh, learning? Jenna, there is a question uh, on the chat by Will uh, saying, do you have any assumed access to technology when planning a course? What has been the general assumption of access con connectivity? So I'm not sure, Ravi, would you like to answer this question? Um, yeah, I can answer uh, maybe one part of it, say with the researchers. So I've been, uh, because those are the courses I've been more um, uh, closely involved in, even in the, yeah, the planning stages. Otherwise, I'm more involved in the development stage. So uh, with the researcher-focused courses, um, yeah, in a way, the answer is uh, yes. Uh, we we have uh, 
we assume that the participants we we uh, uh, they are uh, researchers typically with uh, at least uh, an undergrad degree and often working at a university or a research uh, setting and some of them travel for like field work actual you know research in the field and perhaps far away from a computer um, but the the uh, yeah we, we assume that uh, most of the researcher participants do have access to a computer or even when they're traveling to a, to a, you know, a mobile phone so that I can say for the researcher oriented courses and I'll leave it to Joanna or Veronica to add to that yeah, I think that one of the key things that we uh, we do, uh, we try to assume as little as possible in terms of connectivity and um, therefore, uh, as Ravi mentioned, uh, there is a lot of text based, um, a, a lot of text based content in our courses, but because there is also a bigger appetite for um, for media, videos, uh, multimedia generally, we do include them in our courses, we just make sure that uh, this content is uh, not stopping the others for accessing the key key elements of the course. So it's optional. Uh, it's designed. It's it's brought in a course in a way that it doesn't preclude the others from actually accessing more text-based resources. And we provide for downloadable resources. So we do not expect people to be online. Uh, they can download these resources in advance. Um, so so trying to to really design for kind of the assuming the least uh, in terms of accessibility. And I think it's work to a to, to certain extent because uh, although you know our findings are confirming that that's still a problem, uh, that there is a sizable minority that will actually drop out because of the connectivity and internet issues that um, that the, the the big majority of of um, the people on our courses are able to complete them one way or the other, uh, and that's great. And I think that now the global pandemic, of it, from what we've experienced, is that it's also has started um, changing uh, the perceptions of online learning uh, and the global audience, the global um stakeholders and there there is some investment into the infrastructure as well so hopefully this will this will change uh, pretty soon um thank you very much will and sheldon for coming in with questions i think we are going to move to the next assumptions and in my notes uh oh, okay we have still julie and Simhi who can talk about mobile learning in nigeria yes please come come in that's great julie hello there yeah hi um, hi I don't know if I've got video. Um, I um, have a PhD student who has just completed a, a PhD um, on mobile learning in a university in Nigeria. So he was looking at the student um, usage of, of Nigeria and all the barriers, including technology and, and other issues amongst engineering students. And he found the same sort of findings that you're talking about that um, the barriers are the cost of, you know, having the mobile access. So the students love to use the mobile um, technologies, but um, they couldn't afford the connection. So they would download the mobile um, apps and materials while they were at the university and then take it away and study it at home. On their mobile so they preferred apps that were you know self-contained that they could download and then use offline rather than online ones that needed a connection as well um, and that was due to cost um, but um, what was the other yeah so the barriers seem to be similar to the ones that you're talking about yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Julie, for this. It's very uh, interesting and confirms kind of our um, recent observations uh, during the COVID pandemic, because we've noticed as well that some, you know, these inequities in access, they are just um, 
being accelerated in a way or being deepened in some areas over the other. So there are some universities who are capable of, for instance, negotiation, negotiating internet bundles with local providers and then therefore kind of making sure that their students and their teachers have a better access to technology. But in other areas, uh, this is extremely difficult. And we've heard of students walking miles to internet cafes and uh, trying to do exactly what you really mentioned, just downloading uh, are they uploading their homework there and then downloading next stuff to be able to to um, learn at home? So, um, so yeah, the inequities I think are also at the moment deepening, and uh, there is a lot to to, to be done around that. Um, thank can you I so just, much, everyone. Yeah. Can I add a little uh, comment about um, equity as well and and the COVID experience? Um, I mean the students in Nigeria didn't have laptops. They couldn't afford laptops. So the only device they had was their, was their mobile phones. Mm -hmm. um, in comparison, um, my son uh, is attending a university in Scotland and studying the same uh, engineering topic as these students in Nigeria. So I had a sort of direct comparison between mobile phone usage in Nigeria um, amongst the engineering students there and what my son was doing um, in the UK. And it was interesting that um, during the COVID pandemic, when we were forced to stay home um, and, you know, study from home, the students um, here were not able to access the same mobile learning apps and um, as the ones in Nigeria, just purely because the, the university in Nigeria was set up to do that, you know, whereas in the UK, they were kind of playing catch up. They were not used to having to support students in that way. And they did gradually um, introduce measures that would, um, you know, compensate for uh, the lack of access to um, mobile um, you know, broadband, um, and which was still an issue with the students in Scotland. So they put kind of hot spots around campus where they could, the students could come in and download anything that they needed. But um, yeah. you know, we could learn, we could learn a lot from the university in Nigeria really on how to use mobile. <laughs> Yeah, very interesting observation, Julian. Thank yeah. you for that. Um, Will has a hand out. I think this this would be the the last uh, uh, comment and um, or question before we move on to the next assumptions. Will um, I'll be very quick. Uh, it's <laughs> a thought because there's discussion about repackaging learning to make it available given restrictions of connectivity and device and the consequences in terms of how it's packaged and how it's presented. Has uh, any thoughts from the group about uh, changing the assessment? Because you're talking about sort of delivering content, managing interactions, but is the assessment still the same assessment? Or is any attempt to use things like mobile assessment where people could rather submit text, which is difficult on a phone, submit maybe media, which is actually where mobile is easy to create media. So I'm not thoughts about how the assessments changed as a result of, of, of online learning and the barriers. So from our perspective, um, in our courses, and I can talk only about our courses and, um, and maybe two, two cases. One is, you know, when we use assessment in our courses, um, it's very much around um, assignments that are relevant to people's context, very often written ones, because we do a lot with the researchers in terms of research writing um, and um, with librarians around, you know, improving the quality of, of journals. So a lot of that is very practical and very much around submitting an evidence of what they have improved as a result of the learning on the course and then having facilitators to go through it. So. Uh, you know, it's a different situation, I think, to when we talk about the universities. Now we've had a project um, which we're about to finish, which is with um, four universities, two of them are in Uganda and two of them are in, the, in Tanzania. We've been trying to redesign the courses uh, with those universities, um, just a selection of courses to introduce critical thinking, problem solving and gender responsive pedagogy. And, and here, 
I, I, the, the, the whole project was basically uh, very much around um, still face to face teaching and learning with just elements of online learning, but uh, assessment uh, and the ways of assessing students uh, was a barrier. So uh, because of the of the standard exams the students have to take. So what we've been trying to do and discuss with with the teachers and uh, the project needs was very much trying to do a, a much more formative assessment on the courses and much more an authentic assessment on the courses where, uh, you know, we've been trying to, to teach uh, academic staff on how to develop rubrics for peer review, peer assessment and things like that so that the learning actually is being assessed as it's happening so that the teachers have an idea of how the students are progressing instead of all being done in the final exam, which is still very much prescribed in those countries in terms of the, the generic standard. So it's a bit of a, uh, it, it, yeah, it's a bit of a difficult um, thing in terms of um, uh, online assessment. Um, thank you so much. We are 18 minutes past one. I think we will have time for just one more assumption. And my list is uh, one size fits all. So I'm going to share my slides again and um, give floor to Veronica, who is, she's, who's going to speak about this very much assumption. Okay, I'm so glad the, that the slides are now kind of running properly. Good, thanks Joanna for handing over. Yeah, another assumption is that the use of a one-size-fits-all approach to the development and implementation of our technology-enhanced learning in the Global South is problematic, as it does not take the context into account. In literature, you will find that this is in particular true where courses are developed and imposed from the north for participants in the global south, sometimes alongside a majority of northern audience, what is not the case in, uh, for, for our courses usually. There is a big risk when neglecting local factors such as the attitude towards or the capacity for online learning. Literature shows that uneven power dynamics, uh, for example, between participants and facilitators from global south and north, and the uneven data flow between the global regions can influence the success of learning initiatives negatively. However, we could uh, observe opportunities when participants and facilitators can exchange learning and network beyond borders. That's, for example, the case in our MOOCs. Our experience shows that for the development and delivery of learning initiatives with our audience from the Global South, it is essential to consider their context and to take into account the diversity of learners. But you should also recognize the added value of learning with international colleagues. Next slide, please. Why do we think our learning initiatives are relatively successful, even our MOOCs, uh, which obviously cannot support individual learning preferences uh, or, or just in a very limited way? We believe ENAF's course development process contributes to the good acceptance and performance of our courses. Our co-design decisions with our partners from the Global South are informed by their insight in the context, their social norms, their values in, in their countries. Most of our courses are designed for low bandwidth. Uh, they use plain language and they provide a variety of support and learning assessment levels. When our partners want to reuse our courses in country and uh, build capacity for technology enhanced learning, uh, we, we tailor usually the co-design process to our partners and complement then this embedding process with training. In this way, they can make the right decisions considering the target audience and the mode of delivery. Next slide, please. We had a learning initiative in Sierra Leone um, within the SPHERE project assuring quality higher education in Sierra Leone, short ARCAD, and uh, I feel that can serve as a good example. 
it shows how important it is taking the local context and culture into account uh, when we are reusing any contents. Sierra Leone is a country with still insufficient and expensive internet access. Among students and lecturers, you will find a diverse level of digital skills. The implementation of the learning initiative was made more difficult by COVID-19. Um, there were lockdowns in the middle of the project. The initial project idea was that our university partners in Sierra Leone would use an online critical thinking course that uh, Inas had previously developed. Some of the senior lecturers had recognized that the course contents could contribute uh, really to the improvement of students' employability skills. However, when we then did our initial scoping workshops, it was revealed that a course provided through the internet wouldn't be feasible uh, due to the poor access conditions. And the initial plan of implementing a learning management system was then revised. We worked on alternative approaches, such as providing the courses through Moodle boxes. Uh, you may know that are these uh, portable Raspberry Pi computers with um, Moodle on it. However, this class approach was not feasible anymore during the university lockdowns. Therefore, we transferred the contents then to a so-called snippet version. We put together one pages with learning activities and the lecturers di distributed them through a WhatsApp group to the students who were studying from home at this time. And it was actually mostly the, the only possibility uh, that lecturers could uh, stay in contact with their uh, students. But some of the learning activities were all, also reused in Zoom classes with some st students who were able to use uh, Zoom in Freetown. The learning initiative was supported by a local critical thinking task force uh, of lecturers, and they cascaded the training about uh, such pedagogical approaches uh, to other lecturers. Next slide, please. This quote here uh, from one of the partners in Sierra Leone, I, I think it shows very well that we and our partners agree how important it is um, in the global south, south that we co-develop uh, our initiatives with local partners. This uh, local partner in Sierra Leone said, the approach used in terms of adding critical thinking task force offices in various institutions has been the most crucial aspect in terms of achieving the goals. So going forward, when INASP is contacted or contracted for such a responsibility, try to have people to work with on the ground because these people can relate to their colleagues on their own continent. And they know probably the approach to use in terms of getting people to believe in whatsoever INAS is pushing. Yeah, I, I would suggest then uh, that we again discuss um, this assumption of one size does not really fit well. Um, what is your experience with that? Uh, we would like uh, to, to hear your questions if you have any or uh, your experience with that. I think we will have time for about one question or one comment. Um, so yeah, um, is there anyone who would like to take the floor and comment or share their own experience and ask a question? Do we have anything in the chat? Just checking. Not really. If that's not the case, then I think I'm going to just um, wrap up with our conclusions. Uh, we haven't been able to, we've been only actually able to present three of our six assumptions. Um, but um, I'm going to share the slides anyway. Hopefully we'll be able to um, access them at the later stage and read about the findings from the other assumptions. So. 
from current slide. What are the conclusions? Um, overall, INASP data endorses the wider literature in some of the aspects. Uh, it's clear from the evidence we have collected that issues with te technical infrastructure are a problem for a sizable minority, but perhaps uh, this uh, aspect will improve soon with new investments being made into uh, infrastructures as a result of COVID pandemic. There exists a dichotomy of time pressures. We haven't been able to talk about it today, um, but there is definitely a dichotomy of time pressures. So neither synchronous or asynchronous learning comes without its challenges. Um, however, on some aspects, INASP data is at odds with the wider literature. We have comparatively high completion rates on our online courses and a very high level of positivity about interaction online, which includes appreciation of international interaction and collaboration. And yet other aspects, um, the picture we have seen is rather more nuanced than the one depicted in the literature. When it comes to access and outcomes by gender uh, and country, uh, the picture is complex and differs for specific groups. So there is a need uh, to systematically collect data going forward and disaggregate it by gender, country, region to understand more about those differences and how they change with time. Um, finally, the results of our study are going to be published as a handbook in early 2022. There are three parts to the handbook. We talk about uh, our, our approach to capacity development in general. Uh, then we present detailed findings from our study, including a set of case studies like presented today. And in the final part, we provide clear guidance to global capacity development organizations like ours on how to use technology to support capacity development in the global south. If you are interested in the publication, you can follow us on Twitter or, or visit our website. And uh, we'd like to thank you all for, for coming and listening to us today. It's been a pleasure and we really enjoyed um, all the conversations we've had. So thank you very much for, for participation and making it interactive. Thank you, Joanna. That was really interesting. It was lovely to see everyone getting so involved with the conversation. Thank you, Christine. If you're happy for me to now, I'll end the recording. Yeah.